uh, for England. Um, so it's essentially a government policy. That's, that's certainly how I read it. It's, it's a policy statement of the Department for Transport um, and it introduces gear change and, and the, other, the other changes that um, the government intends to, to bring. Um, so it's, it's quite an important document and, and I think we need to look at the LTN uh, in, 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 the light of, in, the light of, in the light of it. So he talks about this uh, step change in cycling and walking, huge challenge. And, and, and this is a kind of common theme, this idea that we have a unique opportunity now um, ar around uh, the, um, the, the, the pandemic and what that's, what that's done. So one of the things that Gear Change talks about is, is funding uh, and, and the two billion pounds of new investment to be made available, the first 250,000 pounds of that sorry, 250 million of that, I'm sorry, um, is, is coming through the Emergency Active Travel Fund. Uh, we, we still haven't seen all the details of that. Um, and then there will be, uh, that budget will be held by Active Travel England, the new commissioning body and inspectorate. I think the use of the word inspectorate is quite, is quite interesting um, and, and promises there will be a new cycling and walking commissioner. That's not been appointed yet. Uh, but we, uh, I guess in the, in the kind of mould of Chris Boardman and then before him, Andrew Gilligan, um, who's now Boris Johnson's uh, uh, policy advisor on transport and was formerly commissioner for um, uh, cycling in, in London. Um, but then there's this statement that um, government funding for all local highways investment will be a presumption that all new schemes will deliver or improve cycling infrastructure to the standards laid down. And he says that Active Travel England will will carry out an inspection function to see whether local highway authorities are actually abiding by uh, the requirements of LTN 120. So gear change puts it on uh, to a kind of a higher footing. So, so gear change introduces LTN 120 and talks about this higher standards. Isn't it interesting that it uses the term standards, even, even though DFT actually published technical guidance and standards are made by local highway authorities, but Gear change regards it as a standard that it wants local highway authorities to work to. Uh, it says we will now require schemes which receive funding. So it's it's giving a very strong um, steer to local authorities uh, that they have to, uh, in the terms of gear change, embed LTM 120 within their own standards. And it uses this term enforced standard be enforced by Active Travel England. We will expect local authorities to work to them. So quite quite strong words. Um, the gear change uh, uses and sets up the use of the LTN. Um, these are just again a few quotes from the documents to give a flavour um, uh, and you can see you know, some of these schemes are in, in London uh, and the kind of thing that Andrew Gilligan who uh, we think was, was very much behind gear change uh, was referring to phys physically, physically segregated bike tracks on main roads are the most important thing we can do to promote cycle use and lots of evidence that they do lead to higher numbers and a broader demographic of people cycling. Um, it talks about uh, low traffic neighbourhoods, uses the term that's become very current very quickly, low traffic neighbourhoods. And interesting, con consulting on this community right to close side streets, uh, able to petition local authorities. I'm not sure how that will work, because obviously anyone can petition a local authority now, but it, it, it talks about creating a right for people to propose these schemes. So that's going to be very interesting to see how that, how that works out. Uh, it talks about so-called mini Hollands. I, I don't know if you're familiar, but in, in London, again, three outer London boroughs, uh, uh, Enfield, Kingston-on-Thames and Waltham Forest, were given about £30 million each to um, carry out a, a, a lot of intensive work on walking and cycling. Um, and this is Waltham Forest. This is Orford Road in Waltham Forest that was a, a two-lane road with a lot of through traffic and that's being controlled. Uh, and, and now it's cycling, walking and bus only um, and been very, very successful in, in raising the numbers of people walking and cycling. So, so what they've said is that learning from that, they want to invest in up to 12 uh, willing non-London local authority areas to benefit from this intensive investment in, in so-called mini Hollands. Um, new development though is, is also important. This is the um, Eddington development in, in Cambridge. Um, and I think it's not perfect, but this is probably some of the better quality cycling infrastructure that we've seen in new developments. It's very much based on the, the Cambridge model of, of coloured cycle tracks. Uh, you can see this going at the back of a bus stop along a, a main road leading into a large residential development. Um, and, and Gear Chain says we want new developments to be easily and safely accessible and to make existing cycling walking provision better. 
And one of the functions of active travel England will be a statutory consultee within the planning system. So um, it's interesting. I, I think a lot of local authority planners haven't yet woken up to gear change in LTN 120, but interestingly, a couple of weeks ago, there was a scheme that would refuse planning consent in Cambridge because an L, L, the, a failure to comply with LTN 120 was cited as a reason for refusal. Um, so that's quite interesting. So onto the, onto the document itself, which came out at the same time. Um, so it replaces a couple of previous documents. LTN 208 had the same name, Cycle Infrastructure Design. Then there was also a follow-up document that came out in 2012. So the, this, the slash 08 means it was 2008, the 12 means it was 2012. Um, and, and the 2012 one dealt with shared use. And both of those are now withdrawn. It applies in England, interestingly, Northern Ireland, but Wales and Scotland have their own standards. So again, in the forward, um, the quality of cycling infrastructure must sharply improve, not just improve, but sharply improve. And, and again, repeating that message, condition of any future government for new cycle infrastructure is designed in a way that's consistent with the guidance. But also um, for, for government funding for local highways investment where the main element is not cycling or walking, there'll be a presumption that schemes must deliver or improve cycling infrastructure to the standards, again, using the term standards laid down in this local transport note. So that's a very, very strong steer uh, from government, uh, how they expect authorities to perhaps pay greater regard to this document than, than probably LTN 2A and other pieces of government guidance that come along now and again. So it's, it's, it's quite comprehensive. Uh, the, I, I won't go through all of this, obviously, in, in this, in this uh, webinar, we haven't got time, but I, I mean, with colleagues, we're giving a whole four day training uh, uh, course on behalf of the Institute of Highways and uh, our highway engineers on, on the use of LTM 120 and designing for cycling and walking. But, but um, it it's, um, has a lot about the cycling context, the planning for cycling introduces or summarizes the LC WIP process. Chapter four is, is quite key about principles and processes and five about the physical space needed almost regardless of, of what the type of provision is. Six, seven, eight are kind of the, the meat of it really. These three types of provision for cycling. You can have dedicated space within BT highways, or you can have quiet mixed traffic streets and lanes, or you can have motor traffic free routes through green spaces. And, 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 and the, the, the LTM 120 doesn't really prioritize any of those. It says all of those can be good and the network can be made of the, those three. So there is no hierarchy of provision. I'll come back to that. But LTN 208 used to say that cycling on street on carriageway was the, was the best thing to do. Uh, LTM 120 is, 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 is more equivocal. It, it, it doesn't worry too much about what you do. Talk about then transitions. Chapter 10 is very big about junctions. And then we're into the kind of extras, cycle parking, uh, commercial cycling, which is uh, cargo bikes and cycle hire, a, a chapter on traffic signs. And then this important chapter 14 about integrating cycling with higher improvements in developments and then construction and maintenance. And then we've got some um, uh, some some uh, uh, appendices, particularly um, the level of service tools, which I'll come back to the junction assessment tool. So the changes from previous guidance, important changes. For the first time ever, DFTs set out much more clearly what's considered acceptable and, and, and included some scoring um, uh, techniques, which again, I'll, I'll summarize, that enables authorities to assess uh, whether they've met the required standard. As I said, there's no hierarchy of provision. It's neutral on that choice between mixed traffic on quiet slow streets, motor traffic free routes, or protected space on main streets. And the network can be made up of all of those as long as there's a seamless transition between them and you, and you build it up as you see fit. Um, junction design hasn't really been covered in the level of detail that we now see in LTN 208, and that was a move, uh, quite a significant move. It's a longer document than the old one. Uh, and, and much stronger emphasis throughout the document on inclusive design, inclusive cycling. You can see the chap here on a recumbent cycle, he actually is a chap that I know, and he cycles, he's got one leg, a very um, a capable chap, and um, uh, uh, is trusted for wheels for wellbeing. And, and so the very strong element of this broadening of the demographic, all kinds of abilities, all kinds of ages, all genders, and, and so on and so forth. So um, that's really important. And the images in the document try to portray that as well. What hasn't changed? Well, pretty much the geometric requirements haven't really changed. Um, a few tinkering around the edges, but the, 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 the width that you, know, you require to design for cycling has, has been long established and that hasn't changed too much. Um, shared use footway, I, I think the emphasis has changed a little bit, but shared use cycling footway was always the last resort, 
but it, within the hierarchy often you would kind of tumble down to that through the through the sitting process um, for the one to anything else um, and, it, and it doesn't rule it out um, at rural routes where the foot, where foot four is lower I know we'll come back to that but it's really as long as the design is fit for cycling I think we draw a distinction between a cycle track that occasional pedestrians can walk upon and a footway that you're allowed to cycle on because the, the, the quality of provision, the treatment of junctions, the, um, the surfacing material and so on can be radically different if it's designed for pedestrians or designed for cycling. So that's, that's quite important. And I think this is a really key table. This is, this is figure four one in the document. So this is in the chapter that talks about uh, principles and processes. Um, and, it, and it's the, the crucial table, putting aside cycling through green spaces, when you're, on, when you're dealing with highway, provision on highways, at what point is it reasonable to allow cycling or, or to design for cycling where you're mixing with motor traffic? Um, and um, there are lots of charts of this, so every, every guide pretty much has this. And lots of, the chart, lots of the, these types of um, guidance and standards have a graph. And kind of above the line, you would say you would integrate cycling with motor traffic and below it or the other way around you would segregate and we decided not to have a kind of binary choice like that we said actually let's portray every combination as a, as a grid so for example in the top left hand corner we have 20 miles an hour speed limit and we have very low volumes of traffic and many guides would say that you would not normally put in a, a fully curved cycle track in that situation but you might choose to if you've got the space to do it or it's an important route, say, to a primary school and it's a continuation of, of a route that is also fully protected and fully curbed. You may still choose to do it, even though it's a low volume street. So we don't have to rule it out. And of course, what and then what it says in the guide is if you do that, it's green. And that says provision is suitable for most people. Of course, it is. It's it, you know when you're on that fully curbed cycle track, it's green all the way down because you are away from motor traffic and therefore what the volume and speed of motor traffic is it doesn't make any difference and then we move along from left to right with the degrees of protection of step cycle track which doesn't have a buffer strip um, light segregation which is these intermittent features a cycle lane which is just then painted or mixed traffic and when we in with mixed traffic we're now saying and again it's based on dutch practice a lot of this well this is really based on dutch guidance and we looked at other guidance around the world um 2000 vehicles a day about 20 miles an hour, there are thereabouts. Those are the conditions when it's reasonable to, um, most people regard that as, as suitable. And as you go up the other scale, then you reach the point where few people will find it acceptable. Um, and the image on the right, so the image at the, at the top right is the kind of thing that, that a lot of guides have done in the past of, and, and, and a more experienced cyclist would, would find that reasonable and probably it would be a lot safer than if you were um, mixing in with, with general traffic but it wouldn't be attractive to the kind of people in the bottom image. So um, if, if we're about widening the demographic, it's about the perception of safety as much as about the absolute safety. And, 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 and therefore, that's a, you know, absolutely a key point in the document. Um, we, we talk about the, the five, if you've not seen these before, but th these are, again come from Dutch practice. They're, they're in um, uh, London cycle design standards and the Welsh cycle design standards. And it talks about routes that are joined up uh, complete, uh, easy to follow, direct so they don't take you everywhere, um, they are safe and, 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 and feel safe, they're comfortable, they're smooth and, and, and easy and, uh, and without a huge amount of mental effort and, and of course we would prefer routes that are attractive. And, and So those aren't new and they're in LTN 208 but they've now been carried forward into the audit tools. So the audit tools use these headings to assess whether what, what, what is being proposed um, meets the required standards. So they're, they're, they are carried through the document. Um, there's quite an emphasis again on the cycle, um, types of cycle. So we used we, we use the term cycle throughout, not bicycle, because of the different types of vehicle, again with this idea of being inclusive. So there are dimensions given for different types of cycle. And it introduces, um, which is also in Highways England design guidance, which we, we also produced a couple of years ago, the idea of a cycle design vehicle, which is a larger cycle um, that pretty much encompasses all the range of, 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 of cycles that might be in common use. And, and, and hence the cycle design vehicle means that staggered uh, junctions and, 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 and gates and, and barriers are no longer uh, um, recommended at all. In fact, the guidance says that they shouldn't be shouldn't be used because they're very very difficult for larger cycles to negotiate or people who can't dismount very easily. 
Um, so those types of provisions say we can have mixed low or slow motor traffic. This is again an image of Waltham Forest, Orford Road as it was and, and as it is now. So a very successful, uh, pretty much the, one of the first low traffic neighbourhoods. Or we can have those motor traffic free routes. And um, this happens to be the Danube cycle route, the Euro Velo 6, I think it is, uh, the most popular cycle route in Europe, I'm told. Uh, but it's a, you know, it's a fantastic facility. And, and I have cycled it, oh, chunks of it, and it's great. And, and so that, that can be a fantastic cycle route as well. Or we can have space for cycling within highways. And, and, and the, um, the guidance talks about the types of protected space. All of these are classified as that protected space. It's fully curved. So it's raised above the carriageway with a buffer strip. It can be at the same level as the footway, uh, or it may be at a carriageway level or some intermediate level, but it's still a cycle track that's fully curved and protected. Or a stepped cycle track, which is the kind of thing that is often done in Copenhagen, in, sorry, in, in Denmark, and, and uh, actually in other countries as well. Uh, this, is, this is in London, uh, usually a uh, single direction on, on both sides of the road. Or light segregation, and that one in the bottom is, is alongside uh, Hyde Park. And you can just see there's a, there's a painted buffer strip with these poles that are probably about 10, 15 metres apart, just to give that level of additional protection from motor vehicles. And that fully curved cycle track, as I say, it can be at carriageway level. It, it really, this is to do with pretty much the construct, how it's constructed rather than what it is. And um, so we can have it at carriageway level and at intermediate level or at footway level. Um, and and we, we're using the term, we, we, we've got away, or we've, the, the, the document no longer uses the term segregated shared use, which is always a very strange term, um, which is often used for that bottom one. Um, and we preferred not to use it, A, because it, it's kind of an oxymoron, if it's segregated, it can't be shared. But also, it, 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 it almost implies that it's one thing, a shared use path that's been divided into two. And we would rather think of this as, as two things. It's a cycle track, and it's a footway and they should be paved differently and, and, and clearly different things so that users recognise one is a footway and one is a cycle track, even if they happen to be for construction reasons at the same level. And so that's an important uh, distinction. So shared use now just means fully shared with no distinction at all between pedestrians and cyclists. So yeah, there we go, that's the note. So that's, that's, what we, that's a terminology thing that we hope is clear and, and we ho also hope that the new highway code, which I was involved with um, with Cycling UK is going to use these terms and, and just be a lot clearer what we're talking about. So there we are. There's there's again just some images as to what that what that means. So I think you can see the image on the right, which is um, a Black Blackfriars Southwark Bridge, I think it is. Uh, no, Blackfriars Bridge. Um, you know that that is clearly a cycle track uh, and and quite different to the footway that's alongside it. Um, junctions and crossings. So as I say, quite a lot of detail. These are the sort of um, then they're not quite design standards, but they are dimensioned. They they tell engineers what the um, the minimum radii and and so on and so forth, and the the, the road markings to be used. Um, so we we think they they are um, a long way towards a set of um, design standards, and we hope they're helpful to to design engineers. Um, Things like no staggered crossings, as I said, just the, 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 this kind of treating. And one of the one of the key key um, um, requirements of LTM 120 is to treat cyclists as cyclists and not as some strange kind of pedestrian. You know, lumping them together. So you, cycles are vehicles; they can't turn instantaneously. Ninety degree turns are very difficult, and of course, you know, this is difficult for any pedestrians that are mixing in that space as well. Um, this is the kind of thing that is is preferred. This is in uh, Bristol. So you, uh, in a set of traffic signals, we know that cycles travel three or four times quicker than a pedestrian. So in a certain green time given to pedestrians who may only be able to reach uh, an intermediate island within the, 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 the number of seconds that is available within the cycle, the, the, the uh, cyclists can get all the way across. So there's no reason they should be lumped in with the pedestrians uh, and made to go through this convoluted um, route. Uh, so that, that can be done and is, and is a recommended approach to um, to junctions. Um, crossings, um, so again there's a similar, I won't go into the details, there's a similar table to the table um, for uh, figure 4.1 that again just talks about the different types of crossing, where they can be applied for different speeds, the amount of traffic to be crossed and the number of lanes to be crossed in one movement. So what that means is that when you come to a roundabout for example uh, and it's a, it's a high speed and multiple lanes to be crossed then really it has to be a signalised crossing 
uh, in many situations. So that, 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 that it can be read in combination with either standalone crossings or within, within junctions as well. Um, priority side road crossings is really important. Um, so, um, and, and it's almost a, a problem that I think we've been trying to crack since the 1930s when, when cycling was still very popular in, in, in Great Britain and the UK um, and we saw the rise of, of motor traffic. And in the 1930s, an awful lot of cycle tracks began to be built along these new widened highways. But the issue was that they, they struggled with how you would give priority at side roads. And therefore at the time, cycle campaigns began to campaign against those cycle tracks because they felt the cyclists were being shunted off into a second class facility. So if we are going to, if we're going to actually provide these segregated cycle facilities and um, we want them to be fully inclusive, meaning faster cyclists would want to use them as well, rather than feeling they have to stay on the carriageway, they have to have priority at side roads. And we've come up with, with eight types. You can see there's a missing one in the top and we're hoping that some work that Brian Deegan is doing, who's, who's the advisor to Manchester, doing some research at the moment to fill that one in. So just to kind of give you them, um, the, the, the columns are um, where, where the crossing is in relation to the carriageway. So it's either set back a full car length, fully set back, or some uh, length of, uh, less than a car length. So the, the car would actually stick out a little bit into the carriageway as it turns and gives way to the cyclist, or no setback at all, it's right against the, um, uh, the, the carriageway. And then the top two are, we've called marked priority. So there's a legal, a legal requirement for the driver to give way to pedestrian, to cyclists, either as a parallel crossing, the new style zebra, or using just give away markings. So that's the middle line. And then the bottom line is where you'd use the design <clears throat> to indicate to drivers that they should give way. And you can combine design priority <clears throat> with mark priority as well. And the missing one is, is to say, the one that Brian Deegan is trying to get, where you'd have um, simple crossings with no Belisha beacons that could be right against the carriageway. So just a couple of examples. This is in Enfield. This is the Enfield Mini Holland scheme. This would be a full setback mark priority side road crossing, and it can be done. And, and it preferably it would be done on a table. So you actually have a speed table where, where the drivers cross as well, and that's in the guidance. Um, and here's using, this is a partial setback. This is an ACOX green in Birmingham, using a parallel crossing to do exactly the same thing, uh, to give priority to pedestrians and cyclists. Because the first one <clears throat> doesn't do anything for pedestrians. Um, and and um, when it comes to junctions, we've included um, a lot of new style junction techniques. This is one that we had to actually um, convince DFT, let's just say that, to include this. Um, Manchester is doing this um, and they call it Cyclops. We just called it a circulating cycle stage. So in this type of junction, the motor traffic is stopped on all the arms. Pedestrians cross on all the arms. And at the same time, cyclists are given a separate crossing and they can make right turns because cyclists can go faster in the time that pedestrians can cross one arm of the junction cyclists can do a right turn uh, and this is again is in, in Waltham Forest uh, on the Lee Bridge Road and um, there's another view of it um, and we think this is a pretty good uh, Cambridge is starting to do these so they're becoming increasingly popular uh, and this is the Manchester scheme quite gaudy there's, there's a slight kind of arcane difference Manchester prefer to put the cyclists on the outside and the pedestrians on the inside, they think that's better in terms of crossing distances. But and Waltham Forest have done it the other way around, and you know, in, in, in design terms, slightly different pros and cons, but it's the same idea. Uh, and Manchester are really going for these in a big way. Um, roundabouts, uh, conventional roundabouts are highly dangerous, we know this, and so two possible approaches kind of like the mixed traffic or the or, or the segregated. Um, on carriageway cycling, compact tight geometry where cyclists can kind of, kind of dominate in primary position and, and take the lane through the junction or this protected space where the junction is bigger and busier. So here's an example of a, on a quiet, what happens to mini, mini roundabout in, in Islington, um, uh, branded as a, a quiet way by, by TFL. <clears throat> and, um, you know, that, 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 that is reasonable, I think, uh, fair to say. Uh, or where it's busier. Um, making use of the parallel crossings on all arms of a junction so that cyclists um, rotate around the junction um, or as a signalised junction. So the one on the right is how you would do a signal control junction with separate um, cycle and pedestrian crossings on all arms of the junction if you had a signalised roundabout. 
Um, and here's an example, you've probably seen it in the media, it, it caused a huge uh, splash even on the one show, um, it made, 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 made BBC One, but the, um, the so-called Dutch roundabout, but really is just um, the use of um, giveaway markings or parallel crossings on all arms of the junction, plus a circulating one-way cycle track. Uh, there's nothing there that is actually uh, a problem. Uh, I mean, they've slightly bent the regulations in terms of using curves on the parallel crossings, but well, let's not go into that. But apart from that, it, you know, it fully meets all the regulations. And, uh, and we, we included a drawing of this in the LTN, but we weren't able in the time to include a photo. It was finished uh, a little bit too late. Um, I'll just finish on LTN 120 with, with the, the audit tools. These are really important. So, um, and, and it's linked to funding. So there are two tools that um, are given in the document and they're both based on uh, London Cycle Design Standards or the Welsh Active Travel Design Guidance, um, which started with Brian Deegan. Again, he, he, he invented these, fair play to Brian. So the cycling level, of, uh, both of them, it says, um, unless you score 70%, then normally you won't get the funding. So that's quite a high uh, bar, unless you can you know, justify it. So that's really important. Um, the cycling level, so the junction assessment tool, you, you look at every turn at a junction and you score it zero, one or two or band, and you use this kind of um, uh, scoring system. So here's any type of junction, any movement, um, is it like this? So a cycle movement is mixed with or crossing traffic with an 85th percentile speed. Da, 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 da. If any of those statements are true, then you score the movement zero. And to be uh, two, you would have to score this. Cycle movement separated physically and or in time from motor traffic and separated from pedestrians. That gets you a two. You score all of those. So if it's a crossroads, there are 12 movements. The bow sheet will score is 24. Turn that into a percentage uh, and that's your junction assessment tool score. The cycling level service tool uses the five criteria of this, this is safety and, and looks at factors and design principles, indicators, and then has these red, amber, green, and again, critical fails. And the critical fail means that it doesn't matter what your score is, if you've got any of these critical fails, your scheme is not good enough. So at any point along your cycle route, you're mixing with 80th percentile traffic of more than 60 kph, that is a critical fail and, and that's no good. Um, so that's, that's again, based on what London does. So that, that was my kind of run through. Uh, and I just thought I'd finish off with just a few words. Sorry, I, I've only got one screen, so I can't see if there's any chat questions, but we'll <laughs> come back to it later. Um, uh, but it was just, you know, where, where are we now with the, the whole, because we, we wrote LTN, it was going to be, it was going to be LTN 119, and we hoped it was going to come out in, in 2019, but, it, you know, it, it headed into the pandemic and came out during it. And it's, I think, been strengthened as a result, actually. I think the first thing to say is that traffic in travel is changing. And I think we have a, everyone that we all, we, across the globe really, we have an opportunity to rethink the way cities move around, people move around in towns and cities. This is just a, um, a result of a, a, a poll on a webinar I was on where 90% of people on that webinar said they're going to work from home more. This guy on the right is the chief uh, London officer from Homes England. He was referring to a tweet in 2019 where he'd, he'd spent a whole week on the road or trains doing business travel and in June of this year he said it was a lifetime ago and so unnecessary. So I think we're going to see a reduction in commuting and a reduction in business travel and what does that mean? You know that's going to mean reductions in travel. This is where we were up to a couple of weeks ago with traffic and and uh, London in, in London tube and cycling and you can see cycling went up massively we all know that and it was still up even you know uh, in September October still up uh, quite significantly. Traffic down, um, peaking at the weekends, interestingly, peaking at the weekends, but in the week still down and down in the peaks because of this reduction in commuting. And what that's translating to is, and I don't know how it is in York, um, but uh, up until uh, quite recently, and I've been monitoring it, it's going down again, obviously with the new lockdown. Um, congestion is well, in, apart from London, and because in London, you've got these two effects, less commuting, but also a shift away from public transport. So London is back at the level of congestion it was before, but outside London, I just took these eight UK cities, um, congestion is about 30% down across the week. And if you took the peak hours, it's even more down. Um, so, so I think we still have a huge opportunity to think about how we can reallocate road space in, in this country. And, and government was, was you know, referring to that when they came up with the um, Emergency Active Travel Fund and the statutory guidance that came out uh, in, in the summer, and we're waiting for a new version of that and, and the tranche two of this. 
And, and so they talk about, you know, grasping this opportunity, which Gear Change also talks about, of this time to make a difference. Um, what's that meant? That's meant that's meant the huge kind of uh, focus on low traffic neighbourhoods. And I'm not sure where you are in that with York. And I think government has recognised that perhaps the, a lot of these did go in too quickly with not enough consultation and, and, and caused you know, a huge number of, of media stories uh, and, and this you know, divided communities, which is quite unfortunate, really. I think you know, we have to learn from that. Um, uh, but um, I, I think the message, you know, it can be overdone. I, I put this up and I'll put the link to it. This, this guy on Twitter is collecting data on low traffic neighbourhoods. And, and I had a look at it the other day and I, and I think he's identified about oh, well over 100 that have gone in and about 20 odd that have been removed because of backlash. And of course, those are the ones that we hear about. So the impression we're getting is that these are being removed across the board. Actually, probably 80% of them are staying in. Um, and, and if they can survive and probably with the new lockdown survive longer, they'll hopefully bed in and, and become permanent. Because, you know, historic, this is not new. We've historically had, had, had these things. And, and this, is, this is Kings Heath in Birmingham, where we, we've been involved in quite a few of these low, um, uh, low, low traffic neighbourhoods and, and has gone in quite recently and featured on the one show last night, actually, if you saw it. And, and quite a balanced article, I thought um had uh, had had uh, the, the bbc run there so um there we are so that's it from me i hope that's been useful and obviously yeah very happy to um, take questions and go